I have a wonderful electronic invention I want you to see. It, it looks something like this. Welcome to the CTO Studio. I'm your host, Etienne de Bruin. The CTO Studio is where we chat with CTOs building amazing products with incredible teams. Have you chatted with a CTO lately? Welcome to CTO Studio. Thanks, Etienne. Nice the to be here. The CTO and the studio. Mm-hmm. Is it uh, pretty creative? Uh, I can't imagine where you came up with it, frankly. <laughs> it, took, it took Eric and I a really long time to, to try and figure it out. They say that there are names that are empty vessels, and then there, there are names that mean something. Yes. I think I you've think got this, one that means something. Yes. <laughs> so thanks for joining us today. Um, I remember the first time I met you, we were supposed to meet for like 35, 40 minutes, and it ended up being almost three hours. Indeed consuming uh, some delicious beers in La Jolla. <laughs> and since then, I feel um, we've had a really awesome relationship. I've come to your house for some New Year's Eve celebrations a few years back. Mm -hmm. I know your wife, and I feel like um, we're friends. I agree, and I think it's great to be friends and also professionally see eye to eye. It's great when you meet somebody who just sees the world the same way you do. I love it. So... You you came to speak at seven CTOs once, and I mean, you've spoken at our conference as well, uh, but I will never forget, uh, and something that I still use to this day when I talk to CTOs is that talk you gave about, you basically covered two things. You spoke about functional programming, which is something that you love, mm -hmm. and uh, I'd love to get into that a little bit. Mm -hmm. Um, but you also spoke about the importance of um, providing solid tooling as a CTO. So you were speaking to CTOs and mm -hmm. you were saying, hey, uh, you know, it's really important for us to provide the tools that provide the tools. Mm -hmm. and, we, and we had a, a, a really insightful exchange with you about that. So I kind of want to just jump right into those two passions and then kind of see where that, where that takes us because of your sort of Haskell background. Mm -hmm. And your passion for tooling, which I think you've basically built a whole new company around. And so tell me about that. Well, when I was at Microsoft and I was managing a number of different R&D projects, I was really surprised to learn how much of our time we were wasting on using old-fashioned tools. And I think that there's a bias among people who are smart and work in software and IT to say, I can solve this problem. It's okay. I can work around anything. And to feel that that constitutes a form of productivity when it doesn't. It seems to me that what we're doing in IT is every day we're building a factory to build the things that we really want done. We don't run the website by hand. We build a factory that runs our website. And if we're really good, we build a factory that builds factories that run websites. And if we're in the tools business, we build factories for those. So we're working on the derivatives. We're not moving X. We're moving the derivative, the, the velocity or the acceleration of X. Um, we're trying to get leverage in what we do. And as a CTO, I think one's responsibility is really to try to align what's being done technically with what the business really needs to see happen. And too often that gets lost in the daily grind. And we find ourselves just working really, really hard. Just get that release out. Just get that feature built. Just fix the problem that's arisen this week. And we forget that if we're not investing in building a better factory, then the products that come out of our factory are not going to systematically improve or get any cheaper or more reliable. We need to invest in better tools. We need to invest in better processes. That's really what being a CTO is all about, as I see it. Yeah, and I think uh, the way I relate to that is oftentimes the the conversation around, hey, I want to work on the tools to build the factory, or I want to build on the, I want to build the factory to produce the 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 the, the business value. Mm -hmm. I think is often seen then as, oh, well, you're just working on technical debt, or really that's not really budgeted for now. Let's mm -hmm. work on that later, and then sometimes to the own, sometimes to the CTO's uh, chagrin, the uh, uh, it's, we're too busy right now mm -hmm. to work on optimizing process. We have to ship code. Mm -hmm. Well, it's a tortoise in the hair type of situation. If you need to get off the starting line incredibly fast, 
and you're willing to never achieve a high velocity later, then you can just grind it out. But if you intend to be in business for months and years and even decades, then it doesn't make as much sense to focus on the now. But there is a trade-off. There is a trade-off where making progress right now on what we're trying to do technically is key. For example, if you're in a startup and you're trying to make it to a level where you're fundable, you've got to get some work out. You've got to achieve a minimum viable product and a proof of concept. So there's certainly room to just crank it out. But even while you're cranking out that sort of version 0.1, you need to be thinking, what will I do when we're bigger? What will I do when we have more customers? What will I do when we have more staff? If you're not thinking that, you're going to have trouble. Mm. I'll give you an example from a real client of ours. We're serving about 20 different customers, each of which is building software or building IT solutions for their own use of one type or another. Everything from financial technology and cryptocurrency people to people who make medical devices or, or aviation equipment. We have a pretty wide range of very smart people who are customers. And so you'd think, well, why don't they just have all these problems solved? And there are some syndromes that get in the way, some patterns that emerge over and over of almost failure modes for IT projects, or not quite fail, but danger modes that reduce the productivity. And I was thinking of the example of this one company that makes a really successful medical device. And they said, well, we need to have a data cloud that's going to take all the data that comes from all the devices in the world that we made that choose to participate and put that data together so the users can see what's going on with their health and so that practitioners can see what's going on with groups of patients. It makes a lot of sense, right? That's sort of what IoT is all about. They built a V1 product and they said, we just need to get something out there. And what they told me is their design point for the sort of engineering infrastructure that they use, the build system, continuous integration, continuous deployment, or so on, sort of barely existed at the time. It was just sort of thrown together really quick. And they said, well, maybe 10,000 people will use this uh, app that we wrote that takes the data out of our device and lets them monitor their own health on their smartphone. Well, the device is really good and people really like it. And so a million people want to use the app. And the problem is not just the app was never designed for that, the data storage, the, all the infrastructure of how it runs, but the engineering systems themselves were never built to support the number of customers they have. So now you've got the, the CEO incredibly happy saying, oh, everybody loves our device and look, we're being written up as this big success story. But the, the actual users are furious and they're saying, where's my next software? What's wrong with you people? I thought you were trying to help me. And the answer is the engineering tool chain isn't there to get the releases out. Now, is the, the breakdown in leadership there um, not, having, not planning for it? Or uh, is it actually sheer genius that they, that, they, that they didn't waste any time or money on planning for that? And, and now, now the real leadership lies in how do they deal with it now? Or do you think that something mm -hmm. could have been done? Well, it's a great problem to have. Yes. I see what you're saying, right? I mean, obviously, anybody's thrilled to, oh, no, too many people want to buy my product. Oh, boo-hoo. Uh, it's a great problem to have. But I would suggest that among CTOs that I talked with and other executives as well, the problem, and this is going to strike you probably surprising, is a lack of optimism. Now, CTOs are often accused of being too optimistic, starry-eyed dreamers, Let's build this amazing system. But I want to suggest that in the, where it really counts, in the infrastructure, in the cloud deployment systems, the scalability systems, the continuous integration systems, the choice of which programming language and software tools and middleware are going to be used, people aren't actually aggressive enough about mm. saying, I fully intend to have a lot of users. I fully intend to be a target, whether it's a target for lots of workload that I need to be ready for a target for uh, the type of attacks that come to a high-profile site that has valuable data in it, a target for business people saying, where's my feature? Where's my feature? I expect to be a target for all these things. I expect to be successful. How am I going to be ready? That is so good. So good. Because I think we walk around, and actually, uh, um, I think that, and maybe you've come across different things, but I think the CTO generally isn't optimistic, don't you think? Generally, they're more like, okay, I build a system, mm -hmm. you know, sales and marketing, blah, 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 whatever. But you know what? Um, I'm just going to build a system. I'm generally the, the, the skeptical voice, uh, the mm -hmm. voice of reason, the mm -hmm. voice of realism in the strategic meetings. Don't you think that the, C the CTO is not optimistic mm -hmm. enough? Is that's, that what, that's exactly what, what I see saying. happening. Yeah, yeah. I see CTOs saying, I feel like I'm the, the drill sergeant who's covered in mud and dealing with the soldiers who are, who are 
slogging through all this and the, and the people over in headquarters don't understand what we're going through. They tell us, like, it's easy. Why don't you just go take this yeah. objective and if, just, tell me when just, you're done? It's just an if thing, yeah, right? Yeah, right. It's just a bunch of bits, just ones and zeros, right? How hard can it be? It's just computerize it. And so CTOs find themselves playing a defensive game. Mm. Here's why we can't do that. No, 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 no. My job is to tell you, you can't have the things that your users need. And I would say, well, if you're a CTO, you are the person in the position of responsibility. You are the person that the whole company is relying on to find a way to make those business objectives true. And if somebody is willing to go to all the effort to get the money and to get the customers to identify a need that someone has to have met, and then your response is to say, I'm sorry, you can't have that. I'd say, well, is, was that your vision? Is that why you, you know, became a technologist? You could spend your time telling people no? I thought it was to find solutions to that things. That is so, so, so great. Um, I, uh, one of my friends, uh, his, his advice to me is always, he says to me, Etienne, you're always walking around assuming the no or mm -hmm. assuming people are going to resist or mm -hmm. assuming people are going to, uh, feel like it's spam when you reach out. And he said to me, just assume the yes. Mm -hmm. And I think what you're saying is, is be optimistic. And so in that example of the medical devices company, an optimistic leadership would have said, yes, we probably could have 10,000, but you know, what if we had you know, 500,000? Mm -hmm. What if we had millions of people? Right. And at that optimism probably would have shown in the way the system was architected right. to not have a complete you know, terrible experience with scale. Well, and that's why we have versions. One of the brilliant things in software is that we can turn around releases in fairly short timeframes that other industries can't parallel. But you can't sort of build a bridge over a, a ravine and then say, well, I'll come back in six months and double the capacity. And then in another six months, I'll double it again. Right? You don't get that, that mm -hmm. tremendous ability to have release versions that we do. And so we need to be designing for a future that is what our business plans actually call for happening, or maybe even the design for the upside, like what if our business plans are really successful? And then we can use versions to subset that and say, I'm going to design a lightweight version that's compatible with my technical roadmap without trying to build in all the generality at the beginning. That's a CTO sort of thing to do. Ah, oh, so good, Aaron. <laughs> I hear the voice of weary frustration <laughs> in your sigh. No, I think I think the I love the idea of saying versioning is the way we're going to get to the system mm -hmm. we're architecting. Well, people neglect the role of time a lot time, in strategic yes. business yes. planning. They sort of say, "Well, we have to have this logical gem of beautiful purity." And for example, a lot of what I do with my company FP Complete is help people build better engineering infrastructures, DevOps systems, um, new coding systems help them really accelerate the growth of their, their own IT factory. And what I find is that too often people think that if you're going to adopt a new technology, let's just pick on a DevOps for a minute as a family of technologies, you've got to have a grand plan. And somebody says, I'm going to go off and make a great PowerPoint and it's going to explain all the 75 things we're going to do in DevOps and then a big Gantt chart. It's not really necessary to work in this manner. It's perfectly fine identify some quick wins that will really help us now and that will buy us inform back. The f and also inform future decisions. Absolutely. You build a small success and then you tweak it until it works and only then do you build on top of it. You don't build a castle on a foundation of sand. You build a good foundation and a good first story and a good second story and so on. And building these things doesn't require that we know what the last tile and the last bit of the roof of the 15th story is going to look like. Uh, we can get going with an approximation of what the future is going to be. And by getting quick early wins through improvements in our tooling or our engineering processes, we buy back that precious time right away. This is called bootstrapping. We do it all the way in operating systems design from the moment you flip the power switch on to when users are getting work done. We bootstrap in a, a series of steps. Mm. I call it a virtuous spiral because you go around iteration after iteration, but each iteration is bigger than the one before it. So you end up building something very big, but in a series of turns. So how do you bootstrap, for example, DevOps? Well, you say, what's one improvement in our, perhaps our build system or our deployment system or our cloud automation? What's one improvement I could put in place for one of our systems that would buy me so much time that I could then afford to invest in the next bigger improvement? As opposed, as opposed to saying, well, we'll get to DevOps when we are at some scale. Right. When and I'm the king of the world, the here's what I'll do. 
Well, that's great. I, I look forward to seeing that. It sounds on that, awesome. But... On that point, do you think that DevOps is a bit of a misnomer in the sense that it's really um, Dev? So, so challenge me on this statement. DevOps mm. is what happens when the engineering culture doesn't uh, take care of the infrastructure mm. or doesn't I, consider the infrastructure. Well, I would say that you're describing it as a negative, and I have always thought of DevOps in a positive. Um, to me, DevOps looks like this. You've got Dev and you've got Ops. And in between, you've got this sort of middle ground called deployment, where you're done building something, your build is out, but it's not yet running on a production cloud or anything like that. That's the middle part where deployment moves software over from sort of the lab to a production place. And then you've got operations where you, you put that thing into production and you run it all the time and keep it going and maintain it. So you've got a continuum. I would have, I would have named it, it's not so articulate, but I would have named it um, dev DevDepOps because I think there are three parts, development, deployment, and operations. But to me, DevOps is the family of technologies and design approaches that says that's all one big factory. One big thing. It's just producing, running systems at the end and then maintaining them. And the fantasy that we sort of develop things and then we drop it, that's what software looked like 15 mm. years ago when your goal was to stamp out a CD-ROM and then go home. And that's not how running yeah. online systems work. Now, so, so don't you think, so in other words, are we agreeing then that all engineers are in DevOps? I think that's perfectly fair. Well, all engineers in these fields, I'm sure there's somebody who's in you know, clothing factory yes, automation yes, who's yes. not. But software engineers. All software engineers, if they're not in DevOps, then it must be because they're working in something that doesn't have a deployment aspect. But to me, the most telling story, the one that captures this point, is the one about the Airbus A400M that fell from the sky in 2015, just outside the factory in Toulouse. They were doing a test flight and their software in a tiny little computer inside every engine that controls the fuel flow. And the software, I suppose, must have passed its test because it got out of continuous integration and the build came out. And so that morning, somebody says, well, this plane's going to be flying later today. There's a new tested build out. Let's put the new software on the engines. And uh, the plane took off just fine. And the pilot adjusted the throttles downward for uh, climbing out, uh, done with takeoff. And all the engines turned down to idle, but one, the one that didn't have the new software build. Um, and three engines turned down to idle. And no matter what the pilot did with the controls, he couldn't get any more fuel into those engines. And the plane couldn't maintain airspeed and it fell from the sky and everyone died. And of course the plane was also lost. And it turns out the software was fine. It was the deployment where the error occurred. And you say, well, I had this great QA system and this great engineering system for my dev. Well, great. Show me the automation and the QA and the engineered process for your deployment and operations. And then I'll say you're done. Well, in this particular company, according to the postmortems that I've read, the one perfectly well-meaning guy who would put this software onto the engines using a non-automated system missed a step. And there was a file that didn't get copied onto the engines. Unfortunately, it was the data file that said how much fuel to put into the engines. And so the engines couldn't operate. And there wasn't a thorough enough system test, even in a life-critical system. The highest level of QA should be expected. But it wasn't on the DevOps. DevOps is somehow an afterthought. Mm. I'm done writing my software. The rest should just sort of, quote, happen, unquote. Well, how is it supposed to just happen? What's just happen? I've never seen that. So there are people who hmm. think that the engineering is on the dev and then the test of the dev and then uh, miscellaneous. Yeah, just, just, just get it. Yeah, just, just do your stupid computer thing. We're done here. There's no stupid computer thing. DevOps is serious engineering. That is, uh, that's fascinating. I'm reflecting on when I, just talking about the bootstrapping, I'm reflecting on when I build, let's say I have a little prototype I'm building. Intuitively, what is important to me is to get from teeny tiny bits of code mm -hmm. all the way through to deployed and live mm -hmm. as my first little circle. Before, I, right. In other words, I don't want to code the whole app, make sure it runs locally, mm -hmm. passes my local tests, and yes, I'm happy with it. And now I'm going to go and deploy it. My, my development cycle mm -hmm. intuitively, I don't know what it is, is let me just get the app. Let me just understand the mm -hmm. process from writing code to All testing the, the code to deploying the code. And once I'm settled, especially because these tools change every, you know, every year or two, mm -hmm. once I'm settled with that, I feel like as a developer, as a coder, I can now start coding my app 
And now this cycle, as you said, mm -hmm. the circles can grow larger and larger. I think you've really got it. The minimum viable product or even the prototype should include everything through, could I run this for a user? Um, saying I have this running on my laptop doesn't really answer the question at all about can I run this for a user? Does your laptop work similarly to the cloud you intend to run on? How many VMs are you running it on your laptop? How many VMs are you going to have in the cloud? If the answer is zero or one on my laptop, but 14 on the cloud, I don't think you've proven anything that's, by getting it to amazing. run in your laptop. That's amazing. And, it, and, it, and, it, and it, it is becoming more complex, isn't it? It really is. I think that people in the old world of how we were taught to program, maybe in school, we thought, well, the goal is to write one app that runs on one process, probably one thread, on one machine. And the idea that we're actually trying to build a distributed, replicated, complicated machine, plus with a lot of reuse, which is a topic we haven't talked about, that none of that really appears in traditional programming curriculums. So we, we develop really sophisticated systems to solve pieces of the problem. Those become almost solved problems. And then the parts where the real difficulty occurs are the parts where we never bothered to build a proper engineering system because we thought they were minor. So for example, today, a lot of the IT problems are with the security of the deployed system. Well, that doesn't appear anywhere in the traditional development cycle. That's for somebody else that's, to worry that's, about. Let's not worry about that now. Right. But if you look at, if you go to Facebook or pick your place that has a large deployed solution and say, well, how much of their time is spent on things that are outside just developing a single module and having it run? And often it's the majority of time that's spent on those other issues. Do you think, do you think that um, part of the challenge is, is that we're humans who are trying to speak to the computer and map it to concepts that we can visualize and experience uh, and that anything beyond that is, is just that we just cannot even go there with our brains. I think I'm thinking of uh, concurrency, mm -hmm. multi-threaded, you know, get, uh, even 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 with functional programming, mm. which might be a good segue, um, that that as these machine learning and and so-called AI systems are starting to kick in, it's really becoming powerful because these machines are are chunking data. The amount of data being processed mm -hmm. is now going beyond a realm of what we can actually map to. Like when I'm sitting and coding in yeah. my VI session, right. I still feel like I am, and I, let's say I am on an AWS console or whatever. In my brain, I'm still seeing a computer mm -hmm. and I'm typing and I see a machine with a CPU and a fan and a hard drive. Oh. Um, hopefully not a problem that the young ones have, mm -hmm. but, but do you think that there's a mapping of what I'm building for computer systems to how my brain is mm. able to visualize those systems? I don't believe for a minute that we don't have the ability to conceptualize accurately how our IT systems work. I think that there's been a lot of, of hype about, oh, the world has become so complicated, no human can understand it. If that were true, we couldn't do anything, right? We couldn't operate an economy. We couldn't drive a car in traffic. The truth is we know how to conceptualize and abstract situations so that our minds can handle them no matter how complex. If we want to put a person on the moon, we did it back in the 60s, for heaven's sake. Of course we can do these things. The problem is when we use the wrong tool. And then we blame the person for not being smart enough. We say, gee, I gave you a C compiler. It can do anything. But why haven't you solved this problem by now? And you know, one answer you could give is, well, I guess I don't have an IQ of 1,000. Uh, good enough to make this, this old-fashioned tool solve this new-fashioned problem. But that means I need to be smart enough to pick up the correct tool, not blame myself for not having some superhuman powers. I can't fly, but I'm smart enough to get an airplane, and then I can. So when we hmm. look at automation, it's about finding the right tools to solve the problems we really want to. And, and yes, functional programming is a good example too. Because when you look at the level of abstraction that we're programming at, our model of a computer is basically, as you described, it's a physical object. It's actually, to be really precise, if you program in any of the Algol or C or Java style languages, you're actually programming in a style that's meant to resemble a PDP-11 about 1971. It's a simple, single-threaded machine with a very simple von Neumann architecture and nothing of any type is replicated. And you're trying to convince this machine to take a series of steps. And in your mind, you're thinking, if I were to take these steps, it would result in some process happening that I actually want. The machine is way too stupid to know what I'm trying to do, though. So I'm just going to tell it to do these steps. And maybe I'll leave notes to myself about what those steps were supposed to be 
So when I read it, I'll know. But the computer has no idea what it was supposed to do. Why? Well, because it's a PDP-11 with 4K of RAM, okay? Just tell it what to do, and you're lucky if that even fits in the RAM. But we're programming modern, powerful machines with more capacity than our own brains in every machine, and we have groups of them. So we should be developing our solutions at a higher level where we're telling the machine what we really want to see happen. Now, in some ways, we do that every day. For example, I say, I'd like to bring up a storage node, and I'd like to have a half a terabyte of storage, and I'd like it to be RAID 5 and I'd like it to be uh, replicated across two availability zones. Wow, that's actually quite abstract. I don't even know if that's on some disk drives or if there's some other technology, it's some abstract magical storage thing that does whatever I say. That's good programming, right? I'm saying what I want, and I'm trusting the infrastructure to do what I said because it was written by competent infrastructure engineers. But then we look at the inside of our applications, and they're not written that way at all. They're written at these insanely low levels. Increment this counter, then dereference it over to someplace in memory, then set some bits in that spot in memory because I think that's where I'm going to store something that means something. Why on earth would we code that way? That's ridiculous. So modern programming languages, and to me that most of all refers to the functional programming languages, don't make us program in this ridiculous way. They let us program like mathematicians, where we can say, conceptually, this is the definition of what I want done. So, hey, middleware, do that. And if you can do that with multiple threads, sounds good to me. I've given you all the assertions I need about what the runtime conduct of this thing is supposed to be. If you think that's multi-threaded and if that's consistent with what I've said, go for it. And if you don't, well, logically it won't happen. Math will prevent it from happening. We need to program at these higher levels of abstraction if we're to get anything done. And, the, uh, and, and so let's kind of jump into the functional programming landscape. Um, it's not really modern, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's old, isn't it? Isn't it? Functional programming? Yeah. Well, I, mean, I would argue a lot of people would say functional programming started with Lisp, which is decades I was, old. I was about to say um, that. MIT switched to sort of second generation functional programming with Scheme a couple of decades ago in their undergrad curriculum. Um, Haskell that we oh, use. So, so, so they, 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 they went from Lisp to Scheme. Right, okay. which, which introduces more generality and more algebraic abstraction. I would argue that in that genealogy, Haskell, which is what we use most, we love the productivity and bug resistance of Haskell. It's very high performance too. It's probably a third generation functional programming system. A lot of people are familiar with other functional programming languages too. Um, Scala, Erlang, F Sharp, um, uh, ML, OCaml. Um, there are quite a few. Or really, Even Microsoft Excel, arguably, is a second generation functional programming language because you don't tell it exactly when to take which steps. You just say, this cell should have the result of this computation in it, so make it so. Make and it tell so. me if there's an error. Right? That's a nice way to program. It's a lovely way to program. So um, kind of sticking to Haskell a little bit, um, did, if I remember correctly, did FP Complete build a packaging system for Haskell? We started in 2012. I started the company after consulting with a number of people in the Haskell field, um, asking what's needed to adopt more aggressive programming tools in industry. And a number of people in industry as well as academia said, boy, we'd be very supportive if, if you'd be willing to start a company around this. Uh, in fact, one of, the, one of the sort of leading lights of the Haskell academic community even decided to invest his own money in helping us launch the company. A great man named uh, Simon Peyton Jones, who's now a member of the Royal Academy in England, a really truly great computer scientist. Um, but we started the company thinking about Haskell, and we said we're going to become a commercial provider of technology that helps people adopt this this beautiful open source system, which has been in existence at the time. It had already been around for 22 years. This isn't some new idea, but the uh, best Haskell compiler available, which is the Glasgow Haskell compiler had really only been ready for a prime time commercial use for a couple of years. So it was about the right time for somebody to offer a commercial supported um, sort of version of Haskell tools. So we started the company in 2012 uh, with the notion of being the company that people could turn to for commercial Haskell tooling and commercial Haskell work. Um, very quickly that took off, especially with um, the medical device community where there's a huge need for reliability and a huge need for provable correctness, but these days, also a huge need for scalability and getting to market relatively quickly with these sort of data clouds we were talking about and with machine learning. Well, that sounded like a terrible conundrum to them, to people in that field, as well as people in financial technology. How can we get 
the high quality that we need when lives are at stake, or in the case of fintech, maybe I have, I'm trading $500 million on my desk right now. I'd really rather not make a mistake. But yet I need to revise, put in the latest scientific understanding or the latest mathematical or, or even market understanding. I need a rapid turnaround, but incredibly high quality and then massive throughput for gigantic data sets. Well, we looked at that and said, it feels like Haskell is a tool that can actually do all those things because it's deep use of functional programming and a powerful type system that's enforced at compile time will drive quality into the product. Without quality, we will never get our engineering work done. And frankly, if I could sort of get on my high horse for a moment, quality is the big problem in the software industry right now. The average developer spends 50% of their time dealing with bugs and defects. And if you look at where users can't count on software, it's because proper quality hasn't been baked in. You don't bake in quality by writing to something very casually in a Python script and then saying, let's just keep that running for 10 years and run a million copies of it and hope that it doesn't break. That was not a tool designed for this sort of use. If you want quality, you build with quality tools and quality materials and quality engineering processes. And functional programming is just one of those many steps that gets us in the direction of higher quality software. And so um, have you standardized at FP Complete? have you standardized on Haskell as sort of if there is such a thing, assuming that you use the best tools for the right job? Mm. Um, have you standardized on Haskell as, a, as, as some, is, it's our, still there? Yeah, it's our favorite programming language, and we use Haskell uh, whenever it's appropriate, which turns out to be a lot of the time. Um, we found that the productivity wins from Haskell are crazy high. A lot of other companies have told us they've seen productivity boosts per developer when they use Haskell versus more traditional languages. This is going to sound crazy, but boosts from doubling to a 9x increase or even 10x increase in productivity for the same number of people because they're not spending all their time wrestling against the tools. So why would you not do this? You know, people say, well, I'm too busy to adopt a better tool. And I sort of say, well, if your house is on fire, are you too busy to look into fire hoses? This might be a really good time to look into those. So things. I'm a CTO and I'm hearing this, this, this show and I'm thinking, okay, uh, currently I'm a, you know, I'm a Ruby shop or I'm a Go shop or I'm a, you know, uh, and, and, and I'm really interested in help having my engineers adopt and, and benefit from sort of the value proposition that you're making here. Mm -hmm. What would be the A, I would think, what would be the process to convert my shop to mm -hmm. a modern tool, i.e., functional programming shop? And B, um, what, what, what can I expect to encounter as, as, as challenges that, mm -hmm. I, that I should know about right now? Mm -hmm. Not to be negative, but just to be right. aware of it. Well, uh, we've just finished our second uh, very large scale survey of the Haskell community to ask people, specifically on the Haskell side, about these issues. And uh, back in 2015, there were a lot of complaints about tooling. And so we and other people in the open source community spent a lot of investment to improve the tooling around things like version management, daily grind sort of issues that might get in the way of, of deeper productivity. And in the newer version of the survey that we're just about to publish, um, 1,100 people spent a very long period of time, maybe 20 minutes each, to answer this long, painfully detailed survey that I'm very grateful to all the time they spent uh, answering the survey. And what they said is essentially the tools issues are largely solved. There's still some bumps to be sanded off, but it's no longer at all a strategic issue or a showstopper. What people say is the hardest thing now about adopting functional programming is really where do I go for learning materials? I have a smart team. They're great people. They're happy to try new technologies. You know, everybody loves learning new technologies, but where do I efficiently pick up the best practices and get trained and find mentors? So a lot of where people bring in, for example, my team from FP Complete, they say, look, we don't want you to take over our engineering shop. We're a smart engineering shop. We want help getting over that speed bump. Mm. Show us best practices. Show us a typical build system that you would use. Show us which libraries you would typically use to solve this type of problem. And just sort of mentor us so we don't have to reinvent the wheel. Um, I would say if there's one place where the Haskell community um, should really be pouring its voluntary resources, and we're certainly pouring ours into this, it's in education, putting out more blog posts, more example code, more templates, more success stories to show how to use these tools very successfully. We've built really powerful production systems that are amazingly stable and amazingly cost-effective, 
but I am very sympathetic to somebody who says, well, when I just downloaded the Haskell compiler, it was far from obvious what I would do to copy what FP Complete has done. Um, so right now, we offer that as a consulting service, and as much as possible, we try to give away tips at a fairly rapid rate in our blog about how to use Haskell and how to do functional programming. Um, but more broadly, if I could say one more thing, how do I strategically move onto newer tools like this, whether it's Haskell or, or any other major new tools I want to move on to? The most important points I can say are you've got to have a modular architecture to your system. And if your system today is a monolith, you have to break off pieces and start modularizing. As soon as your system is modular, talking across a web API or some sort of clean data interface, all of a sudden you can have a multilingual system with no problem. Monolithically moving a million lines of code to some new language is never, ever going to happen. But saying I have a million line solution, but I'm, I like this, I'd like this one module that's 1% of that to be way more scalable than it is today and way more reliable than it is today. Maybe it's a core engine or maybe it's a new feature that's really sophisticated. Well, let's just write that one in a more advanced and more productive language and use a clean API to talk between those things. The same is true with DevOps. Am I going to move my entire system to some new deployment architecture in, a, in, in one day? Absolutely not. Break off a piece, move it to something better. Learn. Break off some more, move it to something better. That's how things grow. Carpaccio the elephant. Car Carpaccio. Okay. <laughs> That's a so, strange. Oh, no, I, I'll right. skip that one. No <laughs> elephant carpaccio for me, thank you. I was just um, I was just in Laos walking with elephants in the jungle, and really? I don't want to picture them cut okay, up. Okay. No, they're much nicer okay, you're alive. Right, you're right. <laughs> I don't know why. Large animal, big right. daunting task. They're okay, very, they're very sweet animals. Tell me about. Um, uh, so I, I have two questions. Just a quick follow up to that. Um, the general, uh, where does FP complete, or where, where would you recommend? Uh, are you deploying to Google App Engine? Mm -hmm. Are you deploying? Is there AWS services? Are you uh, I, know, I know I know it should be anything anything that is all the time, but mm -hmm. like, do you, have you had experience with platforms that have been better to deploy to than others, specifically as it pertains to functional programming? We have found that it's really productive to write fairly close to the cloud layer. We write directly to AWS interfaces and Azure interfaces, or we do, just do one layer of wrapper on top of those, whether it's our own code or whether it's a tool like Kubernetes where you can design an abstract deployment and then run that across the cloud of your choice. When it comes to higher level infrastructures, I'll be honest with you, most of the clients we serve are trying to solve problems that are so specific that they don't really find something off the shelf that solves mm. their problem. Okay. That's why they're building something new. I kind of figured that. And then, um, uh, what is your take on serverless? Serverless is a lovely technology. Um, it's no panacea at all. Um, I mean, I would say if you wanted to point at panaceas, virtual machines are something that solves a lot of problems. Clouds solve quite a lot of problems. Containers solve a lot of problems. Serverless is nice, but it's really just saying there are times when I don't care. It's just saying, I, it's sort of like memory management, right? There are times when I want to talk about memory, and there are times when I just want to take taken care of. Serverless is a very, sim very similar concept, except instead of talking about chunks of memory, I'm talking about little servers to run service-oriented architectures. Lovely feature, not world changing. Yeah, no, I, I, I. That's that's super helpful. So I want to switch a little bit from uh, sort of. I mean, I could. This this stuff is so fascinating. But Aaron Contora, the human, um, you launched FP Complete, obviously on the on the back of sort of a rich, illustrious career as a as a developer into you know strategic decision making in. In, in the company of some pretty amazing people. Um, today, you're, today your role is CEO of FP Complete. Mm -hmm. uh, you're not closet coding at all, are you? I'm not writing any code for the company these days. Are there, you? There's one thing I miss, it's coding. Yeah. Do you have um, a lead, uh, uh, do you have like a, do you have a CTO or do you have some sort of um, um, lead architect that goes into these companies with you to do the architectural planning or do you are you still proficient enough to just do that yourself? Well, our company is kind of extreme in that we provide CTO-like services as well as developer services and architecture services. So often we'll be brought in by a CTO or by a head of engineering to take a piece of work that needs a CTO level of attention 
Um, uh, literally, just days ago, for example, we were asked by a medical device company to sort of design their whole data cloud. So that doesn't mean they don't need a CTO. It means their CTO has one less thing mm, on the plate. Mm. So our whole company provides services at that level. And I'd say when it comes to the strategy and architecture, sometimes I personally play a role myself if that's called for. But we have several people in the company okay. who do that sort of work. And then so that brings me to sort of how has the transition been for you if we dig a little deeper into your role uh, of being... I'm assuming you, you started your career off as sort of being very hands-on oh, yeah. individual contrib contributor mm -hmm. uh, to joining a team, leading a team, becoming more business-minded, strategic, uh, and then an advisory role. Um, how has being a CEO with that sort of experience mm -hmm. uh, been for you, uh, either as something that you enjoy and love and, and gives you an unfair advantage, or potentially a cross that you carry where you're like, man, I really miss coding. I really miss being sort of in the details. How has it mm -hmm. been for you as CEO of FP Complete? It's a fantastic position. It's sort of like a cross between being a CTO and being a traditional CEO. And at my previous three engagements, I was CTO. So I really can never quite put down the love of technical strategy. Um, but for me, as a person who's hired and managed hundreds of people in my career, the largest team I've run had more than 200 engineers on it um, at Microsoft. Uh, it was the Visual C++ team and a big chunk of Visual Studio. Um, I work through people, and I think the most gratifying part of my whole job, even including all the interesting technology, is actually growing people. If I can look back in my career and say the things that I'm proudest of, they're really making people successful and making teams successful. That's so gratifying that as long as my conversations with those people can have some technical content in them, um, I'm a very happy person. And your technical competence and experience is probably what gives you that, that credibility to be able to then speak into people's lives mm. as you mentor them into... Well, I, I ask people why they like working for me and why they choose to work at an organization where I was either CTO or now CEO. And the feedback I get is very consistent. Um, people say... I like working for a boss who knows what I'm talking about and who really gets, you know, gets what my issues are. So a technically savvy boss makes a lot of difference as opposed to a boss who comes from a non-technical background. Um, they say, I like that there are very high standards for who joins the team. That's, I guess, mm. maybe it's my trademark is very high standards and a very rigorous process for getting to join the team. So people say, Boy, by the time I was done interviewing, I realized if this is how my colleagues were chosen, this is going to be a dynamite team. I get that feedback a lot, and it's, it's really true. We tend to build very great teams, and I'm just so proud, so proud of the great people who work uh, in, in FP Complete right now. Um, and that's been an experience I've had a number of times in my career. And I'd say if there's one more thing that people appreciate, it's that I and the companies I build are sensitive to what matters to strong engineers. Uh, that's great because our customers are strong engineers too. Right? Mm. We're working for really clever mm. people. So it kind of pays dividends on both the sales and marketing and strategy side of the company, as well as on trying to make a great work environment for the engineers who work um, perhaps for me. So for example, uh, we're very, very good at letting people work remotely. Um, we're distributed by default, as opposed to saying, if you're not in the office, we'll try to accommodate you. We say, well, why would you be at the office? Why don't you just be wherever you want to be? We have internet, right? Um, and so we, we work with online tools and we work asynchronously. And we don't assume that the person who doesn't show up at the coffee machine is somehow less interesting than the person who's nearby. Uh, that means a lot to engineers who know that their real work gets done online, not, um, not at the coffee machine. Absolutely. I think it kind of plays into Daniel Pink's uh, drive, which is autonomy, uh, purpose, and mastery. I mm -hmm. mean, those three things. Uh, that's a great model. And, and if we're going to talk about great models, I have to tip my hat to Ken Blanchard and the situational leadership model, which has been the single most useful and most powerful management model that I've ever learned. Uh, just incredibly helpful. Simple model. Anyone can read about situational leadership, and he's got a great book that you can you know, easily get your hands on. Um, he's even got, I believe, training classes that you can take. But the nutshell idea of situational leadership is really for every person and for every skill that that person is supposed to uh, use in their job, they are at a particular skill level of development. And that as managers, we can't conflate a person's skill at one thing with their skill at everything else. 
we need to be sensitive to the differences, not only between people on the team, but for the same person, the difference between how good they are right now at skill A and at skill B. And they might need a very different type of mentorship or, or being left alone on one skill versus another. And if we can be sensitive to that, if we can fine tune to that, we can make a wonderful work environment for people. I have absolutely nothing to add. Aaron, <laughs> thank you so much. Pleasure. Have you chatted with a CTO lately? Hi, thank you for listening to the CTO Studio. If you don't mind, take a quick second and please rate and review the show. It helps us a lot. Go to thectostudio.com for more information on what we're doing at 7 CTOs. We also have a video or two for you that could be a helpful resource for you as you're managing your company. So thank you for listening.